welcome to chapter two of the form of government. So having thought about what the basic organization of our mission is going to be, we turn now to some other questions, which are the questions of what, what do we need to fulfill our mission? So if, if what we need to fulfill our mission to be faithful to God and Jesus Christ are these groups of people in these particular locations acting in certain ways, then um, uh, what kind of people do we need to lead those people? And what does it take to be ready? I mean, I hope you see the logic of these questions. So you start with the mission. You say, well, what um, uh, what, what do we need to do that? Well, we said, well, we need congregations. And then I, I almost just say, what kind of people do we need? We talk about what kind of people we want to be in those congregations to fulfill that mission. Gosh, what, what is it? Who, who leads those people? And then what does it take to be ready to lead? And so this chapter talks about what kind of people lead the people who are in congregations and what does it take to be ready to lead the and then you could say well what, what do you name those people well um we've said deacons elders who are ruling elders who are teaching minister of the word and sacrament pastor other people say priest so we have chosen some particular words that are come from our tradition and um, and then and then talked about well what do, what do those words mean? Deacons comes out of scripture. Elder comes out of scripture. We don't use the word bishop except corporately. We use the word bishop. Ruling elder and teaching elder. We'll talk a little bit about the particularities of those um, nomenclatures. And then minister the word in sacrament, which has historically been our ability to connect across denominations. And really, we're, at, we're coming back to that word now as the Book of Order will change over this course of this summer. Um, the Southern Church in particular used teaching elder and ruling elder as a way to talk about parity between those who are elected by a congregation to lead and then those who are and, and ordained by a congregation and then those who are ordained by a presbytery to lead in, in um, a congregation or in, to move around congregations. But when people who were pastoring a Presbyterian church showed up and said, oh, I'm a teaching elder, it, people said, well, are, are you a pastor? Are, are you a minister? Are you a priest? They didn't understand it. So we chose a, a more ecumenical language, minister of the word and sacrament, then kind of went back to teaching elder, and now coming back to minister of the word and sacrament. For all of these offices, there's the call, which you'll notice is an internal call. It's an external call. So it has to come from within us. It comes from within, outside of us. We believe ultimately it comes from God. It takes a community to do that. You'll notice that there are, we say that we believe these people are gifted from God and we want a manner of life that represents that they've received these gifts. And there are standards, which means that we're going to joyfully submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Historically, this was the section around which we had debates around ordination and human sexuality, so ordination and marriage. So if people are talking about that, Oftentimes, they'll refer to G60106B, which was G20104B in the old form of government. And then when they changed it, that chapter, that, that, that section got moved. Um, I'm happy to walk through that particular history if it's helpful to people. I'm not going to take time to do it here. I want you to notice that there is, for everyone who's ordained, and it's, it's not just pastors who make these promises, but because of our emphasis on parity and our high view of people who exercise leadership in local congregations, we're all called, we've all got gifts, we're all joyfully submitting, and it's all the same language for all of us, and then we've got freedom within bounds. So we're, there's, there's a freedom to work according to our own understanding, but within these boundaries that I invite you to read and think about whether you fit, and, and, and not so much so that you go, oh, no, I don't, so that we're having conversations about how we're centered and what the boundaries are, and now's a great time for you to be doing that. I think there's an important footnote that is on page, uh, well, it's page 26. It's below G202, not that it has to do with the definition of deacons, but notice this. When a matter is determined by majority vote, we either actively concur, passively submit, or after sufficient liberty, 
modestly to reason and remonstrate peaceably withdrawal. People will use that language. Like, is it time for us to ask people to actively concur, passively submit, peaceably withdraw? And notice that that really is just about things that are indispensable. Aside from that, the, the sense is we stay and we work on, on all these issues uh, together in, in community. Deacons have different functions in different denominations. In ours, it's a ministry of compassion, witness, and service, sharing in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ for the poor, the hungry, the sick, the lost. In the former Southern Presbyterian Church, this office was mainly around church finances, and so you find some of that history in some congregations important work to do to make sure that we all understand what deacons do. In our book of order, it is the people who care about other people directly and also more systemically and are, are charged to do that. Often people who do congregational care and work in a community caring for those who are suffering in body, mind, soul, or spirit. Ruling elders are people who come from the congregation or elected by the congregation to lead the congregation. Notice that ruling isn't about ruling it over, it's about measuring. I mean, that that's the ruling is supposed to help us to think about a ruler. And um, uh, these are people who, who assist in leading the congregation. Uh, when they are elected, they are called a session, that's the body. And um, they also then participate in higher councils. Teaching elders, also called ministers of the word and sacrament, we teach, we equip, do a variety of things. And here is what we are to understand ourselves to do. And we're also presbyters, which means that we have the responsibility of governance in, in all councils of the church, as do ruling elders. Lots of emphasis on the parity of teaching elder and ruling elder in our polity. For all offices, um, there's an election, and it goes in various ways. Ruling elders and deacons elected by a congregation. There are terms of service that tend to be three years. You can serve uh, two terms, and then you need to rotate off, depending on the bylaws of a congregation. Every office is prepared, each office differently, but I want you to notice that we take seriously in this polity the preparation for all the offices of the church. Um, every office has the same access to ask to be released from ordination, which means you can lay it aside and say, I'm not supposed to be doing this right now, and then take it up again. And then all the offices can also, what's technically called, renounce the jurisdiction of the church. And if someone does that, then they cease to be ordained. And I'm happy to again answer more questions about that. I would uh, encourage you and advise you to read carefully the preparation chapters around becoming a teaching elder because that pertains to you and your own preparation. Ask any questions you've got about that. There's lots of information around there. Look at what it says about when we start to look for calls and how that works so that you're working with the presbytery and the, and the session that are working with you in terms of preparation for ministry. Some particular notes for teaching elders. You are, we are, if you are become a teaching elder, a member of a presbytery, not of a congregation. Most uh, teaching elders are in an installed pastorate, either as a pastor, co-pastor, or associate pastor. But if you're not, then you can be in what's called a validated ministry, which means it's a ministry that the presbytery says, you know what, this is a ministry that represents the office of teaching elder. It's just not within a congregation. Or you can be a member at large, which means maybe you're uh, not working vocationally for pay somewhere, or you are doing something for a little while that is not uh, using the gifts that require teaching others. It doesn't mean it's not a ministry. It doesn't mean it's not important. You can be a member at large. And then there's a category called honorably retired, which are people who have retired. Read that. Ask that ask any questions about that. There are other forms of service in this section, particularly the commissioned ruling elder or commissioned, it, it has historically been called a commissioned lay pastor, and we don't tend to use the word laity, you'll notice, in our polity. Um, and then there's some words about Christian educators. Commissioned ruling elders are trained by a presbytery and then do pastoral work for a presbytery according to the supervision of that presbytery. It in presbyteries where there 
there's congregations that don't have the ability to pay a full-time pastor, this is a route by which they can have a, a pastoral leadership that has some level of training and supervision by the presbytery. Christian educators, there's been conversations historically in the denomination about whether or not to ordain them. You'll notice they're in this chapter, but they're not ordained. A number of Christian educators would like that. If you look back, you'll see Calvin had had teaching or had um, a doctors of the church. Uh, but but Calvin and historically, we've wanted there to be a necessity for there to be to the sacraments to engage in uh, this particular ordered ministry of the church. And um, that's an ongoing conversation in our denomination. So this is around who leads and and what do we call that leadership? What type of leadership do we need? And then how do we prepare people for that leadership? Um, and this chapter helps us to do that.